Uh, and the rooms will stay the same where they are, so I want all the teachers to be in the same spot. So uh, you can just go to the class you're interested in and uh, come as a way to get some more of God's Word uh, into your heart. And then also, uh, we want to say a big thank you to all of the people who came out on uh, on Monday for the Sam luncheon. And uh, for that, uh, Ev, tell Ev, where are you? You told me that there was a big turnout, right? So yeah, that's a big thank you. I have a little round of applause for everybody, Ev. It's amazing how God provides all the ministries here at the church through you guys. Thank you for your service. Okay. Would you please stand as we open a prayer? Father, you are so holy, so powerful. May every decision we make in our lives be thought out to how do we give you glory. So much of our, our life we were revolving around filling our own needs or desires. How often do we say, how does this bring my Lord, Lord, who saved me from death? May we not simply just say that you're the most important thing in our lives, but that you are the very center of it. What am I but a created being, redeemed from the pit, given fullness of salvation by your sacrifice on the cross? So as we sing to you today, let our hearts be thankful, encourage one another, in the words in these songs. We read your very scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's what we want to start off with. We want to make sure we're getting God the glory and not ourselves. So I invite you to please sing nice and loud. We sing to God be the glory.
stand as you may be seated if needed. I want to read a few verses for you from Colossians chapter 1. He, obviously meaning Jesus, the very Son of God, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Don't forget that. Don't think of that Jesus' existence started in a manger. Jesus is God, the very God. He was the creator of the world. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, I'd like you to sing uh, to, to read this one verse with me out loud, if you would, please. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Opportunity. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. You understand that a church, when we say the church, when the Bible talks about the church, it goes way beyond the establishment of some local assembly. The head of the church is not the pastors, it's not the elders. We are considered the under-shepherds. There is one head of that church, and that is Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And so when we sing, we're, we're united with the saints around the world, those who are here and those who have already gone ahead. We belong to an eternal fellowship that worships the one true God. So we're singing a song now that some of the young people probably won't know, so it's going to be up to uh, the older folks to really sing this one out. Understand where our church's foundation comes from. That's Jesus Christ alone.
that we would be called the children of the living God, of your church being your bride. May we continue to grow, be sanctified, and be presented in holy blameless. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, you may be seated. Our scripture for this morning is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 10. There we read. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. At this time, I'd like to call the ushers forward. And as you will see, we have a theme this morning. Younger and better looking. Younger and better looking ushers. Younger and better looking pastor. I'm not sure what I'm doing up here this morning. I'd like to call your attention to the missions of focus that are found at the bottom of the order of service. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to uh, pray for these and any other things that God has laid upon your heart, and then I'll lead in corporate prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord of power and of strength. Wisdom. Lord, we just bring you our praise this morning. Lord, we just want to lift you up and give you the worship that you deserve. Lord, we just come to you humbly this morning, knowing that we are not worthy. We are not worthy to be your children. And yet, this in spite of all of our shortcomings, in spite of all of our failures, you and your ultimate wisdom have decided to love us. Love us as children. Adopt us from this world, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for not only adopting us, but the church family that you've surrounded us with, Lord. What an encouragement it is to have brothers and sisters in Christ that know you and know your word and can use those things to encourage us when our walk stumbles, when our walk is weak. Lord, we thank you so much for that. We thank you for the truths that we find in your word. Lord, help us to be earnest and diligent about going to your word each and every week, Lord, seeking those truths. Lord, we pray for Pastor Caleb this morning as he brings us your word. We pray that those things that we hear we will not only hear, but also be able to apply to our lives this week. As we take this offering, we ask that you would bless it, and you would multiply it, and that you would use it for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
I had a number of years with this student, uh, teaching them and building a relationship with them. And upon graduating, it's a letter that they had written to me uh, after, after their time was up. And the student said this, Wow, hearing the news about you leaving was not a surprise, but, a, but difficult to hear. Having you as a youth pastor, confidant, advisor, and friend has meant the world to me. You were the one who helped me grow in my newly found faith and showed me warmth as I adjusted to my new life here. Moving isn't easy. I know how hard it is to pick up everything and leave people you love behind, but God's plans are true, and I know this next church needs you as we did here. I spent this week trying to find the words to tell and show you how much you've done for me, but all I can come out or come up with is thank you. Thank you for chasing us down our first visit to say hi. Thank you for treating us like family the moment we met. Thank you for always being there to guide and genuinely care for how I was doing. Thank you for the opportunities you have given me. They have made me strong in my faith. You have changed my life. You taught me so much, and I can't wait to use it to show others. And I don't say that again. I don't stand up here to read that and say, look, look what I've done. And look. But the testament that, that was the encouragement and the joy that that brought me to see a student who didn't have to write anything to me, who could have graduated and moved on, but to see how God had worked in their life through the years of me being able to simply be, be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And it's really something that Paul is going to touch on here in this passage this morning uh, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Pastor Jace had uh, preached last week uh, really at the great personal cost and sacrifice uh, you know, of Paul. In verses 1 through 5, we see that, that Paul, a great personal cost and sacrifice of being left alone there in Athens and Corinth. If you go back to Acts chapter 17 and 18, you can read uh, about that. But he sends Timothy back to the, to the Thessalonians. I'm not going to be able to say that word this morning either. But uh, he sends Timothy back. A great personal cost to himself that he was uh, under great pressure. Uh, and facing persecution and, 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 and troubling times. But he has such a, a genuine care and concern and love for these people that he's willing to be left alone to send Timothy back to these people to see how they're doing. We know that from verses 1 and 2 uh, of chapter 3 when he says, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. Athens. And we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, and spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. Paul was willing to be left alone. He was greatly concerned and distressed over these new believers, these new converts in, in Thessalonica. So much so that he was willing to, you know, to be by himself, to give up the 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 strength and the encouragement that comes from, from having fellow believers around. He sends uh, Timothy to these Thessalonians because he's concerned. Because there's, a, 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 there's these trials and, and these hardships and difficulties and persecutions that are upon these people. Right? Paul had, had, had warned them. He, he'd written uh, about these persecutions that were coming in verse 4. But he said, in fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that you would be persecuted, that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. And then in verse 5, he, he's concerned and he's distressed over the fact that these people uh, were being tempted by the tempter. And that they were going to succumb to the difficulties and the persecutions at hand. We see Paul in, in great distress. But as we come to verses 6 through 10, we see that Paul's very real concern and his distress uh, it, it is flipped upside down. We see uh, one uh, in the last passage of, of, of a psalm. 
somber note, and it moves to a joyous note. There's a dramatic shift because of what about because of what's going to happen. Timothy is going to return to Paul and give him some excellent news. And we see that Timothy returns here in, in uh, verse six. We begin where he says, "But Timothy." has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Paul's ecstatic. He's overjoyed. Hey, Timothy is returning, and we know from, from this passage, and we get the idea from this passage that Timothy, uh, Timothy's return here has been very recent. Uh, and, and, and Paul is writing this letter soon after Timothy's arrival. And he says, but now, Timothy. That but now, Timothy is, is a suggestion, or it suggests to us, right, that upon hearing this news, he cannot wait to write back to the, the, the Thessalonians, just how overjoyed, how ecstatic he is upon hearing the news that they have stood strong and stood firm in faith and love, and that they held pleasant memories of them. He can't wait to, to, to relay this news back that he had just heard, back to these Thessalonians, that, wow, I'm so excited that you are remaining firm and standing strong in the faith. This good news it, it is, it is wonderful joy, great joy to Paul. The word for good news here in Greek is, uh, my Greek is not great. Uh, I never took great, uh, Greek, but I will do my best to pronounce these words as well as I can. But the Greek word here for good news is uh, euangelism. And uh, typically this term in Greek is used for the preaching of the gospel, for God's saving work. And here in, in this uh, passage, it, it's, it's the only place in the New Testament in which it's used for something other than the preaching of the gospel. It, it, it's uh, more in terms of general good news. But the idea that Paul wants to relay here is how greatly this news had a had affected Paul. Paul was so affected by this news. This news was so joyful, was so good to Paul, that it was like hearing the gospel to Paul. That's how great of news this was to Paul uh, uh, upon hearing how they had remained faithful in light of persecution and difficulty. This news caused Paul's heart to leap for joy. I think Paul had not spent a ton of time with these people, but these are new believers, they're young in the faith believers. And imagine, you know, these young in the faith believers coming under persecution, and, and again, the, the, the distress that would have caused Paul. These people are new believers, and already Satan is bombarding them. And the temptation would have been real to give up, to throw in the towel and say, this isn't what I signed up for. But Paul, who has poured in his heart and his life and his love to these people and who has taught them, hearing how they have remained faithful, it, it brings him great joy, great encouragement as we're going to see, great comfort. It's as if hearing the gospel of Paul. This report, this good news that has been brought from Timothy, has put a new heart into Paul. It's restored enthusiasm and vigor into Paul. Again, you look at where Paul was just in, in, the, in these first couple verses, and how the mindset has now completely changed, the attitude has changed dramatically for Paul. One of distress, one of joy. And as I was looking at this passage, I, I couldn't help but think, uh, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, sports and athletics. And uh, th this picture kept coming uh, to my mind as I, as I was reading this. And, and you see the, the shift in Paul's mindset and attitude and demeanor. Uh, and, and there have been numerous times, especially in baseball, 
uh, that uh, when you're getting beat pretty bad in a game, your whole demeanor and attitude is pretty low. And uh, one thing that I loved about uh, my, my high school baseball coach was that no matter what the score was, whether we were winning by 10 runs, whether we were losing by 10 runs, uh, when we were up to bat, he never let us sit on the bench. He said, you're going to get up to that fence, and you're going to cheer on your teammate. You're not going to sit, and you're not going to slump. We're still in this game. Right? But I, I can remember times when you're, when you're down by a lot of runs, or down by a lot of goals, right? Your, your whole attitude is just like, man, this is, we're done, it's over. I don't even feel like cheering. There's nothing to cheer for. We're getting destroyed right now. But something happens in a game, and you get an inning in baseball where you start scoring three, four, five runs, and the next thing you know, you're back in the game. You're down by a run, or the game is tied. And all of a sudden, your whole demeanor is different. The coach doesn't happen to tell you to get back up on the fence. You're up there, you're the most obnoxious team, uh, you know, cheering, cheering your players on at the fence. Man, I used to hate those, those guys. Those teams that just like, they're always yelling, right? Obnoxious chairs, like, that's so stupid. But the reality is they're in it, they're demeanor, you know, that they know they're in this game, they're winning this game, and I see that here in Paul, that Paul, he's down, he's distressed, but something changes, there's a flip of the switch. And Paul, there's a renewed enthusiasm and joy and energy and vigor in Paul, that is clearly seen as it's evidence. And why? It's because these people are faithful. Persecution had not succeeded in quenching either their faith in Christ or their love for God and their love for others. My, what joy that brought to Paul. As somebody who had, who had the ability, who had the privilege and responsibility, as Nick had said, to be an under-shepherd, right? over these people. These were people that Paul had, had spoken to, had loved, had viewed as family. And to see them successfully staying true, trusting the Lord, remaining faithful, loving God and loving others, renewed his enthusiasm. This faith and love had been observed by Paul in the past. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we see Saul had a, or Paul had observed uh, this uh, faith and love. He says, we remember, I'll start in verse 2, just to give you that. We thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had witnessed this faith, this love. And to hear that this faith and love, the same faith that he had seen, was still the same, now that it had been tested, now that it was under, under you know, persecution, Paul was overjoyed. He said, I, I've seen it, I've witnessed it, I've, I, I've observed it. And how great it is to see that you continue to exhibit the same type of faith and the same type of love for the Lord and for others. <coughs> this faith that, that Paul speaks of deals with the trusting of the Lord. This trusting God. And this love that Paul mentions it is the outworking of that faith. Faith of a true believer is manifested through love. Paul says that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. He says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And Paul it is condemning the Judaizers. Faith and love are primary marks of a genuine believer. Especially when their faith is tested. Despite difficulty, their trust remained. Their love for God and others stayed true. The saving work of the, uh, of the Lord, that the gospel had changed their lives, had impacted them in such a great way. 
These were genuine believers that almost immediately upon coming to the faith, it was tested. It would be no better time for Satan to attack, right? A new believer, a young believer in the faith. But Paul, in a short time, had taught them sound truths of God's word. Doctrinal truths that they clung to, that they hung on to. And it made all the difference when they were faced with difficulty. But the good news had not stopped there for Paul. There was, there was more good news. He goes on. He says, but just now as Timothy has come to us and has brought good news about your faith and love, he has also told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. These were people that loved Paul, that loved the missionaries, loved Paul, loved Timothy, loved Silas. It says they had pleasant memories. They continued to have pleasant memories of Paul and the missionaries. The word there is agathe, the Greek word, meaning good. And not just a good recollection of past events, but good memories of when they were together. And they longed to be back with the missionaries. The Greek word for longed is epipatheo. It's close, I know. <laughs> but there's this idea of that word there, and this, this feeling of intensity, this great desire to be together. Paul had a, had a very similar de, uh, uh, desire. Pastor Jeff had spoke on that back in uh, chapter 2, verse 17 through 20. We see Paul's longing. And he says, Brothers and sisters, we were orphaned by being separated from you in a short time. In person, I thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly. I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. This yearning to be together, this great desire, this, this longing to be together was mutual for, for, for both Paul and his people. And here you see this, this, this beautiful picture of, of Paul as their teacher, as their shepherd, or their under-shepherd, caring for and, and loving these people as a family. And I often wonder, do we long to be together? Do we have a great desire to be with the body of Christ, with our brothers and sisters? Or is it one where we just say, ah, you know, I, I've seen those people about five times in the last seven days. I don't need to see them again. Do we have a, a, a longing and desire to be together? Because when we're together, it brings encouragement. It brings strength. It encourages unity and faithfulness. We see these similar affections for one another, for Paul and his people, and for the people in Paul. They loved each other. They saw each other as family. As we go to verse 7, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. See that word, therefore. Yes, what is it there for? Why is that word there? Or some of your versions may have, for this reason. Therefore, for this reason. We saw it mentioned in verse 5. For this reason. Or therefore. Right, in verse 5. That was pointing to what was following. For what Paul was going to say. Now in verse 7, we see, therefore again, or for this reason again. And this time, it's looking back to what Paul has just said. He addresses them again as brothers and sisters. There's this view of them as family. They are family whom he loves, whom he cares deeply for. He says, because of the above mentioned things, because of your faith and love and your longing to be together, therefore, Paul says, I and my colleagues are greatly encouraged, are greatly comforted. And this encouragement
encouragement comes to Paul in a very difficult time. In very difficult times, we see in all our distress and persecution. The word for distress there is anginke. Literally meaning a choking, a pressing care. And the word for persecution there in Greek is philipsis, which is a crushing trouble. We get the idea here that Paul's situation was anything but a pleasant one. Paul literally says, my situation right now is a choking one, is a crushing one, is a pressing one. But upon hearing the news of you and your faithfulness, that far outweighs the trouble that we're in. Hearing of your faithfulness matters so much more. This encouragement reaches him at a time when he needs it most. Also very significant for us to remember, and so important for us to remember, this is why we need to get it. We're going through difficult times and situations, and each one of us may be experiencing different trials or hardships different times in life, but man, when we're surrounded by those we love and family, we have those to encourage us. Or even for those of us who may not be in, in difficult times in life, when we see our brothers and sisters remaining strong, remaining faithful unto the Lord in the midst of, of, of hardship, how encouraging that is. How that energizes you as a person, you as a believer, how that energizes me as a pastor to see that. How that energizes the pastoral staff to see the congregation remaining strong and faithful in the midst of adversity. So Paul says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in the midst of of distress and persecution. The news came about it could have come at a better time. We were encouraged because of your faith. Your faith in the Lord. When you listen to Paul's words here, he says, for now we really live. It's as if Paul wasn't even living. He says, for now we really live. Verse 8. Since you are standing firm in the Lord. Paul here is saying, I'm, I was finally, I'm finally able to relax, to breathe again. There's this weight, this burden that has been lifted off Paul. He was so caught up in distress and it, and he, it seems as if he couldn't function, but he says, now we really love, we, we really live. Because he was reassured that he had not labored in vain. The idea there that his time spent ministering to these people was not empty or void or pointless or for nothing. Imagine Paul going to these people, spending the time that he had, putting forth the energy and the time into these people. Loving them, preaching to them, teaching them. For it to all be done away with it and falling away. That would have destroyed Paul even more. But we know that wasn't the case, or this wouldn't have even been written. But we see this news brings great personal encouragement that his labors were not for nothing. But these people were standing true, standing firm. There's that military term again. Not backing down in the face of an, in an attack. I can also relate to Paul here. Sometimes when you're in youth ministry and uh, you teach every week, and every week you ask them, So what did we teach on last week? And nobody can give you an answer. And sometimes when you, when you do that and you, and you, you see, well, maybe they're not really paying attention. You're like, why am I doing this? I don't think anything's penetrating their ears. Is this for 
nothing? Are they getting anything out of, out of all, the, all the time and energy that I put forth? And sometimes it, it can be discouraging. But what great joy then that comes. What great encouragement that comes when you receive a letter like that. But you see young people up here singing, playing instruments, using their gifts for the Lord. Or as last, uh, last summer when we went to Peru and having my first opportunity to, to lead uh, you know, a mission trip overseas, seeing young people ministering to others well, loving children, being faithful to the Lord. There's no greater encouragement and joy that comes than from seeing that. Than seeing young people who you poured time and energy in, into, carrying the mantle. And even for us as pastors, and, and, and uh, you know, I speak for, I know I speak for Jace and Jeff and Nick. But we spend time teaching and preparing and we see the body of Christ. We see a uh, Korean Bible church using their gifts and their talents and ministering well and remaining faithful. What great joy comes from that. There is no compensation that could beat the joy and encouragement that, that comes from seeing the Lord's people be faithful. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, these young believers, these new believers, how encouraging, how comforting it is to see that they were steadfast and firm in the faith. This was great joy for Paul. That their faith was unshaken by opposition. Does that bring us joy? Does that bring encouragement when we see our brothers and sisters standing strong in faith? Does that excite you? Does that, does that get you energized? Doesn't it? I mean, isn't that awesome to see? Or when we see a brother or, or, or sister who has, who has lost a loved one, who is going through sickness, and we see them remaining strong, keeping a testimony for the Lord. Joy, it's a great joy to see people come to faith in Christ and to see people mature in the faith. And Paul is seeing this, he's witnessing this, and it brings him great joy. Similar to the joy that uh, the Apostle John had when he, when he uh, wrote uh, in 3 John, verses 3 through 4, he said, It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth. Telling how you continue to walk in it, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Paul has a similar joy, a similar encouragement and comfort. And Paul's reaction to this news is one of thanksgiving. In verse 9. He says, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Immediately, Paul turns this reaction of good news, this encouragement, he turns it into thanksgiving. And the Greek literally reads it this way, what, can, what thanks can we pay back to God? Paul understood the situation. This could have been a source of pride for Paul, couldn't it have been? Look at this church that I built up, and I must have done something right. Or he could have given credit to, to the Thessalonians here. But no, he immediately acknowledges where thanks should be acknowledged. He understood the reality of the situation that it was God who opened their hearts to his preaching and teaching. It was God who had made these believers what they were, who they were. Paul was simply an instrument being used by God. And so Paul gives credit where credit is due. 
It was the Lord who deserved the praise and the thanksgiving. And that's immediately who Paul gives it to. What thanks can we pay back to God? There is none. We thank the Lord for opening their hearts, for sustaining them, for, for giving them the, the strength and the ability to withstand the attacks of, of Satan. And he rejoiced over his brothers and sisters. He thanked the Lord that he had something to rejoice in. It was because of the Lord that he had received such great, such great news. Do we rejoice over our brothers and sisters in their faithfulness? Ultimately, ultimately it's the Lord's doing. And this thanks leads Paul to prayer. <laughs> Reaction of, 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 of Paul's hearing this news is one of joy, which leads him to thanksgiving, which leads him to prayer. In verse 10, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. That present tense verb there, that night and day, it doesn't mean that they prayed once at night, once in uh, you know, the morning or once during the day, but there was this idea that they were frequently and repeatedly praying. That prayer was central in their lives. This wasn't an isolated or random you know, thing, you know, but this was something that they were continuing to do. This continuing uh, of prayer over the situation. Requesting of God. But Paul goes even further and he says, We pray night and day most earnestly. There's a use of a double compound here, and it's basically, you know, to say in excess, over and above, overflowing, exceedingly above, super abundantly, is basically what Paul is saying here night and day. They are superly, abundantly praying. Praying beyond the normal measure for this request. You see the devotion, the love, the care that Paul has for these people. And his request really is twofold. We see this longing to be reunited with the, with the Thessalonians again, as well as this longing to be with them. So he could supply what was lacking in their faith. That word supply means to make complete or to bring to maturity. Katartizo is the word and it is used for the mending of, 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 of nets or the, or the resetting of bones. We long to be with you so we can supply, or I can supply what is lacking in your faith. The idea here is uh, um, that Paul was not saying that their faith was defective. Paul had just uh, been overjoyed and had complimented and praised them for, for remaining you know, faithful. For their spiritual achievement, but they recognized, but he recognized that you know they had come up short, that they weren't there yet. These were new believers. They had a lot to learn. They had more to learn. Their faith still needed completing, rounding out. And we know that our faith is never perfected or completed as long as we're here. But this bringing to maturity is that Paul was concerned with. And he was praying for them. He was praying spiritually for them. <clears throat> but he also wants to continue to teach them. He wants to teach them God's word. And continue to give them truths to stand on. how important, what a testimony it is to the teaching of God's Word and how it brings stability in the faith. Paul was faithful in teaching 
God's word to these people from the beginning, to teaching doctrinal truths. And I believe that it's because of that that they were able to stand in the face of adversity. As Pastor Jay, Jay said, mentioned last week, he gave you the story of that uh, woman and her husband who, who uh, you know, in, in the midst of, of adversity, their faith crumbled. And they became atheists. It's because they were not taught sound, true doctrine from God's Word. And when Satan came and tempted, their faith failed. But when we build our lives on the truths of Scripture, when we have our brothers and sisters praying for us to strengthen us in the faith, to keep us in the faith, how much of a difference that makes. And it's why it's so important to us here at Berean that we teach God's Word, that we teach the full counsel of God's Word, because it's necessary for staying true to the Lord, for standing firm in the Lord. Paul loved these people. He cared for these people. He wanted to teach them. And he was praying for them spiritually. We pray for each other spiritually. Oftentimes when we pray, it's over physical things, which aren't bad. When's the last time you, you prayed for your brothers and sisters spiritually? That they would remain faithful unto the Lord. That they would continue to love the Lord and love others. That they would continue to grow and mature in faith. Paul saw this of utmost importance, and he's actually going to go into that. Pastor Jason should probably talk about that next week in verses 11 through 13. When you come to a passage like this, it's an awesome reminder that ministry is a mutual act between pastor and people. It's a giving and receiving on both sides. It's a ministering and a being ministered to. We have the, the blessed uh, privilege and opportunity to be able to teach you and preach to you from God's Word and care for you. But there is something of great joy and encouragement that comes from when we are able to preach to you, seeing you take God's Word and apply it to your lives. It energizes us, seeing the body of Christ faithful. And so we see this mutual act of ministering and being ministered to and, and, and how God is at work. There's a tremendous joy and comfort that these people had given Paul. But immediately we see Paul says, I, want, I long to be with you. I have this great desire to be with you so I can continue to teach you and continue to see you grow in the faith. That is why being together is so important. It is an absolute must that we be together, that we fellowship with one another. Do we love one another? Do we care for one another? Or is it just, I don't really, I can care less. I don't need those people, I don't need to see those people. Family, we're brothers and sisters. Do we care for each other spiritually? We ought to be a church that ministers to each other's needs, that encourages each other by being together. Is there somebody who has been an encouragement to you? Is there somebody who has brought you to the faith, who has, who has challenged you to grow in the faith? Have you ever taken the time to thank them? You know the joy and the encouragement that that could bring to that person? We should have an overwhelming love for one another and spend time praying for our brothers and sisters. I believe that there should be a thriving ministry. Prayer is absolutely essential. 
church needs to be devoted to prayer. See in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, as Samuel is uh, giving his farewell speech to, to the Israelites, is the, the people of Israel have, have made their demand for a king. And though Samuel did not agree, we know that uh, that was not God's will for the people of Israel to have a human king. It says, though I disagree, right, in, in verse 23 of chapter 12 of 1 Samuel, it says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good. <coughs> we should be a people marked by prayer. Prayer for one another. Teaching one another. That means we must be together. Christians were not made for isolation. We are made to be together. To be in relationship with one another. Boy, oh, Because when we're together, it strengthens us as believers, especially when, when, when others are going through tragedy and difficulty, we're able to encourage one another spiritually. There's a story, and I thought it was pretty interesting, how God always works these things out. I didn't tell Nick, but... Our closing song is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And I wanted to sort of end here with an illustration behind Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. It was written by a man named John Fawcett. And he was born into a poor family in Yorkshire, England, when he was orphaned at the age of 12. And to survive, he uh, had to accept a, a lengthy apprenticeship to a tailor. And while he was in his teens, he heard the great George Whitfield preach, and he became a Christian. And while serving his apprenticeship, Fawcett, he had become active in a Baptist church and was often asked to speak. And at the age of 25, <coughs> newly married, he was invited to serve as a pastor of a small church in Waynesgate. The people of that village were very poor. They were able to pay very little, and much of Fawcett's pay came as potatoes and other produce. And once his wife Mary began having children, they found it difficult to survive. And Fawcett had learned then, later on, that a pastor of a large Baptist church in London was retiring. And he let the church know that he would be interested in serving him. So they called him to be their pastor at a much larger salary. So John and Mary began packing their household and began preparing to move. But it's told that Mary could not. She told John that day that she didn't think she could leave these people whom they learned to love. And John followed her statement and agreed. And that day the two of them unpacked the wagon and let the London church know they wouldn't be coming. And Fawcett would go on to, to write a number of hymns during his lifetime. But from this situation, he wrote, Blessed be the tie that binds, to convey the sentiment of those whose wife to the poor people among them had chosen to live. And Fawcett served that church for the rest of his life, 54 years. There was a love there, a fellowship there. Do we share a similar love for one another? Blessed be the tie that binds. Our faithfulness can bring great comfort, great joy, great encouragement to each other. Will you be a caring, loving Christian? We love in the way that Christ has called us to love in the way that Christ has loved you and I. Paul was greatly encouraged because of their standing in faith, standing firm in the faith. Recognizing the importance of 
ministry and are ministering to others and being ministered to. The encouragement that that can come from those that we sit alongside with every Sunday. Be an encouragement to others. I'll end with the last part of that note that I began reading. The student said, thank you for all you do and have done. You have made this church a second home for me. You helped me blossom into a person with a strong passion for the Lord. God can use somebody like me. He can use somebody like you. He wants to use somebody like you to be an encouragement, to bring joy to the lives of others. Who can you be an encouragement to? Who has challenged you? Who has helped you to, to grow in faith? Who can you reach out to and thank? Don't underestimate the joy that that can bring to somebody and how that can restore. Ministry is not always easy. Even for us as pastors, there can be a lot of discouragements and low points. But to get those tiny bits of encouragement can go such a long way and oftentimes come to the most unique times. God wants to use you to encourage, to bring joy to others. Are you willing to let it? We are a family. You love one another. You love one another like the Thessalonians love Paul and like Paul loved the Thessalonians. I know that we as pastors here, we love you. We love you and we care about you. We want to see you grow in the faith. We want to see you stand firm in the faith. And there's no greater joy or reward than to see that happen. That's better than anything that we could ever get paid. Seeing the Lord's people stand strong in faith. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. But we thank you just for each other. For the, the joy and encouragement and strength strengthening that can come from being together, from hearing each other's stories, from seeing each other's faithfulness. Lord, give us a love and care for one another that we desire to be together, or to be unified together, Lord, seeking to, to be more like you, seeking to, to share these truths with others. Lord, we love you, thank you, and praise you.
gift to the family. A family that's closer than blood. It's been brought together by your Lord. May we continue to grow in love with each other and stronger and stronger, knowing that we have an eternal bond, one that was bought for us on the cross, and solidified in the resurrection of your Son. And we all have a future and a hope in you. May the Lord bless you, keep you in God's space, shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.